The scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 39 through 55. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped into her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise to her. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful. To Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. May God bless the reading of his words. Now we have uh, the sermon titled, Mary's Song of Praise by Pastor Peter. Sawadee so, Krap. Again, it's the Sunday before Christmas, and our final Advent scripture today, as you have heard, is from the Gospel of Luke. Um, in it, we will mostly take a look at the last 10 verses where Mary sang a song of praise uh, to God. And for some of you, you may know that this, in a way, this song of praise is actually famously known as the Magnificat. Um, and it's called Magnificat because that's the Latin form of the English word magnifies, which is what Mary said in that verse. He said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Uh, this song, or this Magnificat, is actually the first of four nativity songs in Luke's Gospel. Uh, that means it's one of those songs composed and sung because of the occasion of Jesus' birth. Uh, there's other songs that are like that in Luke, such as Zechariah's Benedictus, the angel's Gloria, Simeon's Nunc Dimittis. Uh, I'm trying to highlight this just, just to show that all these songs, in a way, they're actually the very first Christmas carols ever sang in history. And that makes Mary's song, or the Magnificat, the very first Christmas carol ever. And unlike today's Christmas carols, uh, Mary's song, it doesn't talk about bells that jingle, or decking the halls with boughs of holly, or it doesn't talk about the nose of a reindeer. Um, in this song, you hear nothing about snow, or sleigh, or partridge in a pear tree, uh, or Santa Claus. Uh, instead, Mary's song, uh, this praise song, has everything to do with what really makes Christmas, Christmas. And to think that Mary sang this song while she was still pregnant with Jesus. It was not even the first Christmas yet when she gave this first rendition of a Christmas carol. Now, some of you may ask, why did Mary suddenly sing this song? Um, what I mean to say is, what is the emotional content behind Mary's song of praise? Uh, now suppose I ask all of you this question. Uh, what would make you celebrate wildly with total abandon? Uh, what would make you jump for joy 
and be totally happy and feeling ecstatic. Um, I mean, what would that be? You know, perhaps it would be a news that someone very close to you who had been sick was actually getting better and is about to go home. Or perhaps it could be a message from someone saying that all your work issues, all business issues, that's, that's all taken care of forever, seriously. Or perhaps it could be news that somehow you don't owe any more money or credit card debt or student loan or mortgage. Uh, none of that. Uh, or what if you receive a phone call or email from an employer saying you've been promoted or you've got that dream job that you've always wanted in your life. Um, or perhaps it would be news that your significant other will finally propose. Or maybe you just heard that you're going to be a new parent or a new grandparent. Or perhaps by some impossible miracle, the Lakers win the championship this year. <laughs> um, whatever the case may be, you might end up doing things that you know you wouldn't normally do, right? You know, other than jumping for joy, maybe you want to do a little dance, uh, or maybe you want to shout and behave like you won a million dollars. And perhaps you may even tell everyone in social media or text your family and friends or actually call and you know, hear a voice on the other side and tell people about your great news. Uh, but if you're musically inclined, perhaps you may want to sing a song. You might even want to make up a song as you go along. And the lyrics of your song can come from poems or other songs that you already know. And this song can come up and can be sang while you're clapping your hands and moving your feet or just doing anything that displays some sort of rhythm. Uh, I won't do that because I may not have rhythm. Uh, but otherwise, you know, my point is I just want to give you an idea of how to read or actually perform Mary's Song of Praise. It is a song of intense and indescribable joy and celebration. Hopefully you get the point. There's this New Testament author that says that this song is actually one of the most famous songs in Christianity. It's been whispered in monasteries, chanted in cathedrals, recited in small churches by evening candlelight, and even set to music with trumpets and kettle drums by Johann Sebastian Bach. This song by Mary, it actually proclaims the gospel even before Jesus declared the gospel. It is like a shout of victory and joy even before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and even before what happened in Calvary on Easter Sunday. It is really a song about God. It is a celebration of God. It is actually a song about a revolution that God is about to bring into our lives. Now, I think that's a little different than some of the typical Christmas carols normally here today. Now, now, why do you suppose that Mary just suddenly burst out uh, singing this song? Why was the news of the birth of her coming son so important that, and, and what does it have to do with God? It is important because back in those days, Mary, Elizabeth, and the people of Israel, I mean, they, they all had a dream. It was a dream that one day, everything that their prophets had said will finally come true. One day, the God of Israel would do what God said to Israel's ancestors, that God will bless all nations through the family of their great ancestor, Abraham. But for that to happen, the powers that be that kept the world in slavery need to be defeated. Uh, I mean, nobody would normally thank God for blessing them if they were poor or hungry or enslaved or miserable like the people were back then. God would have to win first a victory over the forces of evil of the empire surrounding Israel. So Mary and Elizabeth, what they did was they searched the scriptures and read the Psalms and prophecies that speak of God. 
God's mercy, hope, fulfillment, reversal of conditions, a revolution, a victory over evil, and God coming to the rescue. So all these thoughts and dreams were concentrated into Mary's song that is injected with biblical scripture, especially from the song of Hannah in 1 Samuel. And I don't know if you're familiar with that song, you know, as Hannah celebrated the birth of Samuel, about what God was going to do through Samuel, Mary's song celebrates what God is going to do through Jesus. And her coming son, Mary's coming son, Jesus, is the reason or the means that God's revolutionary change will happen. As we said, Jesus is the reason for this season. Now, some of you, I mean, those of you who are pretty sharp, uh, when you look at the verses, you may ask, uh, wait a second, Mary never directly mentions Jesus in the song. So how can this song be about Jesus? Well, first off, Mary is able to look beyond what God will do through Jesus and instead praise God, who is the one responsible for giving us His Son. To magnify means to enlarge. And what Mary wanted to enlarge or magnify was God, you know, her vision of God. And her goal in singing and celebrating was to show God's greatness. She wanted to magnify God and not even her own position as the mother of the Son of God. Although the song says something about Mary being blessed, Mary knew she was blessed because of who God is and not because of who she was. Uh, most of you probably know uh, Mary was just this ordinary girl that God chose to play a part in His plan to save not just Israel, but the world. There's nothing super special about Mary that made God chosen. She didn't earn God's favor or earn the privilege. Instead, God simply chose her. And her faith, Mary's faith, it didn't come on her own, but instead she was expressing the faith that God created in her when He heard the news from an angel that she will have God's only son. So, even as the scriptures portray her as this humble and blessed woman, it is obvious from the song that she wanted God to be seen as great instead of herself. In her song, Mary praised God for who God is and His many divine traits. Mary worshipped God's divine power, His holiness, His mercy for sinners, His faithfulness in keeping His promises. Mary did not just dwell on her own happy circumstance, but instead rejoiced in who God is. She rejoices in God because He is God. As much as we rejoice in God with all our songs, because He is God. But as much as I say that this song is also about God, I can also definitely say that this song is also all about Jesus. When Mary says that all generations will call her blessed, it is because everything that God has promised that will happen is actually growing inside her belly. Growing inside her is the Son of God. He is God's truth, God's faithfulness, God's forgiveness, God's presence with His people. Jesus did not come just to save Israel, from the empire of Rome, but He actually came to save us. He came to save the world. And out of His mercy, Jesus will save all generations of those who believe in Him and put their faith and trust in Him. Um, now, that kind of sounds way beyond the revolution Mary dreamed would happen to the Jewish people. Um, as you can see, Jesus is not just Mary's baby, He's also Mary's Savior which is why she is called blessed. And think about it, Mary didn't even know the full details of God's plan and how God will save those who believe. What she did was she simply believed in God's word. 
And when Mary celebrated God, the main point of her celebration is not about the birth of her child, but the revolution or change that her child Jesus would one day bring to all the earth. Now, what is this change or revolution that Jesus was supposed to bring? Um, I mean, many people have written so many things about that. Uh, for example, in this article by John Ortberg called The Six Surprising Ways Jesus Changed the World, John points out several areas of revolutionary change that took place because of Jesus. Uh, for example, in the ancient world, children were left to die of exposure. It, it was ordinary, particularly if they were girls. But Jesus' treatment of and his teachings about children led to the forbidding of that practice as well as the establishment of orphanages. Um, in the field of education, the ancient world loved education, but they tend to just give it to the elite, to the rich people. Uh, but the notion that every child bore the image of God, and you know how Jesus is fond of children, this helped the world move towards universal literacy, uh, no matter which background you are and where you're coming from. Then love of learning led to monasteries, and then universities such as Oxford, Cambridge, and Harvard. It all began with Jesus' command to love God with all your minds. And in the area of compassion, Jesus' compassion for the poor and the sick led to institution for lepers and the beginning of modern day hospitals. So that's why even today, hospitals have names like Good Samaritan, Good Shepherd, or St. Anthony. Uh, they were the world's first voluntary charitable institutions. And in terms of the attitude of humility, the ancient world did not value humility as a virtue. But Jesus' life of humble service would eventually lead to the adoption of humility as a wildly, widely admired virtue. Historian John Dixon writes, it is unlikely that any of us would aspire to this virtue of humility were it not for the historical impact of Jesus' crucifixion. And in terms of the attitude of forgiveness, the ancient world, they did not value forgiveness as a virtue because what's more normal is to reward your friends and punish your enemies. But Jesus had this alternative idea of forgiveness. He said that what is best in life is to love your enemies and see them reconciled to you. I've given you all these examples, but all these examples really, they're nothing. They're nothing compared to the most important revolutionary change that Jesus brought into this world. For those who believe in him, Jesus brings everlasting joy, no matter what the circumstances in life 